Give it up to both sides. Give it up to yourselves for, for being here and enjoying it. If I may please ask the panel to join me back for a quick, because we really want to hear from the experts on this, because I think a lot of us saw some really great things. And before we get ahead of ourselves, I'd love to ask Coach the same question that I asked him at the beginning of the game, what should we be looking for? I think uh, really it, we get a good insight to hear from him on the X's and O's. So, Coach, without further ado, what did you see in the first half? Dave was right. It was uh, a pretty phonetic first five, ten minutes of the game. Um, you know, there's two players from the U.S. that are starting tonight that uh, played at UCLA, uh, the right fullback, uh, the number six, Beltran. When you watch him at the beginning of the game, he's really nervous. The first time he gets the ball, he has this little patent. Um, where he cuts the ball behind his plant foot and he loses the ball. But um, he came in in his own a little bit. The, the first goal comes, I, I always tell my players on the team that uh, soccer is a lot like life, that every little thing matters and every, every, everything you do matters. And so the first goal comes from the right fullback clipping the ball in. Uh, Wanderlowski gets fouled. And the free kick that they hit, is a great free kick where Brad Davis, an end swinger, hits the ball with his left foot. And one of the strengths that the U.S. will have in the World Cup, and to me, one of the best ways that they'll have an opportunity to score goals from a free kick, from a set piece. And so Omar Gonzalez gets up, has a great header, keeper makes a save. But then the next service after that from Graham Zuzzi is even better, and that's how the goal comes. And so really the game was, was hectic at the beginning. Um, the U.S., I think, a little bit fortunate in the second goal because the cross, even though I think uh, Tony Beltran will say that he meant to hit the ball to Michael Bradley, <laughs> he absolutely did not mean to do that. But it's but, beautiful. But Michael Bradley, because of his work ethic and his tenaciousness to get forward, a great flick header, and, and Wondolowski gets on in the back post. Beautiful. Dave, your analysis? Well, I did mention that it was going to be a fast the first 30 minutes, but I was feeling very good about myself, and then I remembered I predicted Mexico 2-0, so nobody knows it. You know. <laughs> the great screenwriter William Goldman said about Hollywood, no one knows anything, so I don't know anything. But uh, I did think it was a very uh, entertaining first half, certainly. I thought Mexico's midfield is lacking a, a lot of creativity and, uh, and a little bit of class there in the midfield. I thought the, the players up front were working hard for Mexico. They didn't get a lot of service. And Michael Bradley and Chris Wondolowski just dominant in that first half. And the United States was really pinging the ball around, which they don't always do, but they look good doing it tonight so far. Gustavo, what happened? Well, what happened? well I, I told you. <laughs> he I was told right. You, yeah, you were know, right. <laughs> I'll tell you that uh, the, the American team is much, much better. But before going any further, I got my cameraman right here. I would love for those uh, rooting for the United States to cheer up and do some noise for the camera. Do some cheers. Is that the way you, there you go. I want to use these images tomorrow, okay? No, really, really, really for my newscast. That's why I'm asking you to, to do that. So going back to the game, uh, I was expecting this. Uh, my, my friends here have uh, been, uh, been telling exactly the, the, the same thing. Uh, they, don't have a, they don't have a team. They don't have uh, this cohesiveness. Is that the way? Is that the word that I'm Co looking for? Cohesiveness? Uh, sorry, you know, my British accent sometimes <laughs> betrayed me. Uh, but um, it's going to take a lot of time, time that uh, El Piojo, the Mexican coach, don't have uh, in order to put the, the, all the pieces together. And, um, well, remember, as I told you, th those guys are there for the money. Um, that's not the Mexican team. Um, I'm expecting all the sponsors. They're really pushing for those uh, players playing in Europe to be part of the team. You know, the Chicharitos, the Guardados, the Giovannis, all those guys. Uh, and it's going to be a different team. And uh, Marco Fabian, uh, so far, his test has failed. Yeah. It hasn't had a lot of service. I don't mean this disrespectfully. It's a genuine question. Mm -hmm. If this is not the real Mexican team, is the real Mexi te Mexican team really any better than the team we're seeing, though, tonight? They should be. They should be. 
really? But I don't know the way they've been playing of late. Oh, I mean, they've been playing horrible. Yeah, so I mean, horrible. Right, right after the how war, many guys um, can you pick and then say, well, that's our team finally. You know? I believe uh, the, you know, the, the Mexican team is the one who who won the, you put the on Olympics. The shirt, you the should gold, be playing gold medal. for the country, and you and they're and they're trying. Certainly, I'm not saying they're, they're trying, not. but they're, they're bad. <laughs> but the, are there really I mean, let's be 23 honest. other guys in Mexico right now who are so much better that they're going to somehow... Uh, yes, they are. I, I don't agree, quite frankly. I think some of these guys I mean, really beginning with the... We have a fat goalie, man. <laughs> you see the, do you see our goalie? He's fat. Moises is all right. That's why fat. this rivalry is special. The goalie yeah. that you'll see in the second half is a better player anyway. Right. So in, in Corona, who I... Did, right. the, did the game on last night mm-hmm. is a very good goalkeeper. Certainly, right. he'll be he'll be a factor. Yeah. Uh, but I also think there's actually some Americans that I'd like to see from Mexico who didn't come to this game, but also weren't even called up. Edgar Castillo for Tijuana. Right. Yeah. I want to keep an eye on him. He had a great game last night. So these are also factors. So certainly, this is not these are not the two teams necessarily completely that are going to go. But I think it's kind of indicative of the, what the United States could look like in in the summer. Yeah, right. I agree absolutely. With that. Now, Coach, uh, speaking of UCLA, Nick Romando. What did you think of his performance? You know, it just goes to show that soccer is a sport that you can be tall, you can be maybe not fat, but <laughs> you, you, can, you can be uh, fast as long as you're smart. And he's a very smart goalkeeper. He, you know, he's not that tall. He's less than, less than six feet tall. But his positioning and reading of the game, there was one play, there was a, a back pass to Omar Gonzalez, and it goes to the inside of Omar, and you can see Nick Romano already opening up to change his angle. Just little subtle things that he does in his right. positioning. There's a cross that he has to come for. And, you know, when, when, when a keeper's short, teams are going to put balls in the box, but he shows he can command his box, and so maybe that deters some of the attack. Right. But things you can't see, his communication is great. His organization is really good, and so he's, uh, he's representing UCLA really well. Good, good. Proud of UCLA alums in the house. Give it up for Nick Romando. UCLA, yeah. Go Bruins. Woo! Yes. And, and going back to, you know, Dave asking about what's fundamentally changing about Mexican tactics, you saw Layun being the only source of attack, right? Throwing yeah. down the flank and throwing centers. And it's like Andres Guardado might have been doing the same thing, whereas with the U.S. midfield game was beautiful, right? There was a lot of precision. Talk a little bit about that in terms of what you saw in terms of tactics, strategy. Is that indicative of of longer-term trends that you were seeing, or is this something new that we're seeing tonight? I think Dave? it's indicative because I think Mexico has struggled in the midfield for probably 18 months already, at least. So this is nothing new, unfortunately, for them. I think uh, their wing play has been good at times. But, Coach, you can speak on the tactics more. I, I, I do think Mexico struggled in the midfield for a while now, so this wasn't a real big surprise. Yeah, I think it was smart the way Klinsman lined up the team. You know, They refer to the midfield as being in a diamond, and what that means is... So you have Beckerman, who's the deepest. You have um, Bradley, who's playing as the eight. He's not necessarily playing as a 10, but more as an eight. And then you bring in Graham Zuzzi, he comes inside a little bit more. And the other side of the diamond is Brad Davis. And so what that's done for Mexico, Mexico hasn't been able to adjust in the midfield to bring, so on the opposite side. So let's say Graham Zuzzi has the ball. The right midfielder for Mexico has to come all the way inside but he's staying too wide. So it's always three against two, four against three. So it's playing into the hands of, of the United States. Yeah, my, my colleague and I were noticing the U.S. defensive line, whenever the counterattack, Mexican counterattack, there were seven guys already in the back. Yeah, right Whereas in Mexico, there was, when the attack came, two or three defenders. They were always being, you know. Some of that is the U.S. being a little cautious at times, almost too much, I think, sometimes. I think they play a little bit too defensively. Some of that is that. But, so Mexico's never going to get too much activity on the counter, I don't think, against this United States team. But uh, I do believe it, it, it does start with that, the diamond that Coach has said. It's been, an, it's been a dominating performance for the midfield right now. You know, it's going to be interesting to you watch this game and to your point that Mexico is not as strong as some of the teams the U.S. will face in the summer. When the U.S. scores a goal, you know, they go through a moment of do they continue to try and push forward to score the second goal? A couple times they give the ball away in bad spots, and Taylor Twelman, one of the announcers, is saying, against Portugal, against Germany, you can't do that. Yeah, do that. They can get away with it tonight, but against better teams, you know, the mentality is 1-0. Do we make sure we don't give up any chances, or do we go after that second goal? Sometimes going after the second goal makes you vulnerable. Got what should, any questions from the audience at this point? Anybody... Any hands, any observations? Because we have some really, really nice soccer minds here on our panel that can dissect this 
every which way from Sunday and want to take advantage of that knowledge. Question over here. Oh, thank you. Um, if this is such an important rivalry, why wouldn't Mexico have its best players on the field? Uh, it's not a FIFA date, so it's not like a mandatory game. So it's more like, uh, as I told you, they're coming for the money. <laughs> and uh, this is the thing. It's a partnership between the American Federation and the Mexican Federation. Because I don't know if you guys know, but uh, all of these games play in the, in the American soil. It's being uh, partners with, with the uh, American Federation. So get the, they, they get a, a very good share of the cake. So it's, it's business. Yeah, they, they mentioned the stat. This is the 81st friendly in the U.S. for Can Mexico. you believe it? Twice as many as in Mexico itself. Yeah. So, so I, see, I see a couple hands. And let's, how much more time we have? We're, we're going to see the screen come up on halftime. But as that happens, I want to be able to field as many questions yeah. to take advantage of the great panel. I see a hand over here in the middle of the lane. Vera. Okay. Um, who do you think is going to be subbed in second half? I think Julian Green, they talked a little bit about the youngster. He's 18-year-old who just now has decided to play for the U.S. I think we'll see him in the second half because there has been such a, a big deal made about him changing uh, his, his allegiance from Germany. Uh, I don't really know who else we'll see necessarily uh, for the United States. Mexico, I think uh, the coach and, and Gustavo could speak a little bit more on who you might see from Mexico. Yeah, there's a young talent. He actually plays for Seattle, uh, DeAndre Yedlin. And the right fullback, like I said, as much as I want him to do well, I have a feeling he's going to make a change. And uh, the other thing what Klinsman will do, he'll test some players. So the, the guys on the bench see the U.S. play a great first half, great tempo. So he might throw Landon Donovan out there to say, how are you going to respond if you don't start? Can you go in and, and raise the level versus maybe bring down the level? Okay, if I may say something. Please. Uh, this is a great opportunity for, for the U.S. team to really demolish and uh, make a stand. Uh, this is the right time. I mean, if they really push the, uh, the envelope here, uh, we can have like a 4 or 5 zero today. But I don't know if uh, Klinsman is willing to do that because probably he want to try, you know, some new players, uh, do some, uh, I don't know, some exercising, so trying some new stuff. But uh, if, uh, if, uh, if uh, the, the American team is really, really push the pedal here, oh, they can create chaos today. And uh, I don't know what, what will happen to El Piojo and that Mexican team, right. really. What about subs for El Tri? Do you guys, any, anything that you like to That's see? That's the thing. I mean, who are you going to call? <laughs> you go to the bench and say, oh, my God. <laughs> Can we get Donovan? Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's the case. It, pretty much what uh, El Piojo uh, calls today, it's uh, um, players from America. His, his team, he used to be his team. He, he used to coach uh, the team. So he called seven players from America. And uh, pretty much that's what we are saying. We're saying America, which is like uh, uh, not, not playing that good in, in the Mexican league. And, uh, but uh, they, they got to play what they have. Right, they got to play with what you got. Dave? <laughs> I'm just amazed. Gustavo, like, America must be the worst team in the world, right? No, it's Club not. America is one of the best no, teams in on the North country. and Central and And especially, South you know, America the counter attack that the American have, uh, I love it. I mean, well, I think it, coach it, here knows. Honestly, I mean, we're seeing they go a like, lot. boom, pam, boom, there. Yeah. In fairness to Gustavo, we're having fun, but we are seeing a really good display from MLS, too. Right. So yes. that can't be overlooked. That this is an entirely, virtually an entirely MLS team, yes. except for Julian Green coming from Bayern Munich. So... That's a great first 45 for MLS as a right. whole. And you have two amazing European vets and, and Bradley and, uh, and Dempsey coming yes. back to show him some really great veteran leadership. And Marquez on the Mexican side, but he's in the twilight of his career. You know, this, any other questions? I saw a couple of hands raised here in the middle. Okay. I think we'll take one, maybe two more, and then we'll be ready for the, for the kickoff yeah. of the second half. Two quick questions. How, how does a coach decide when, when you're 1-0? Okay, do you go for that second goal or do you not? I mean, like, that's got to be a lot of pressure. And, and it seemed to me everybody, uh, you were talking about a tight center there, but it was really tight. I mean, they were stumbling all over each other, it seemed to me. I, what do you right. think? I mean, you soccer, there's so many different scenarios, and that's a great thing. There's hundreds of thousands of different actions in a game. 
And as a coach, you try and train the most important things. Tactically, when you're up 1-0, down 2-0, up 2-1. So you go through those game scenarios and say, when we're in this situation, this minute in the game, this is how I want you guys to perform. This is what I want you to do. So you go through all the potential scenarios, and hopefully it comes out the right way. I think that's, what, that's a great question about the U.S. team, specifically with Jurgen Klinsmann. I think he's done a great job of going for that second goal, going for the third goal at times, whereas other coaches who, with the U.S., and I thought they were decent coaches, I don't think they really always did that. I think they played back. We get up 1-0. Let's hold on as, as much as we can. Jurgen Klinsmann doesn't do that. He didn't do it as a player, and he doesn't believe it as a coach. So I think he's always going to look for that second goal, now the third goal maybe to start the second half and really keep the pressure on it. I like that out of him as a coach. Like boxing, you know, one-two punch. Yeah. So we're about to kick off the second half. I want you to please help me in thanking the panel once again for joining us this evening. <laughs> Say fans de Mexico, do some noise, please. <laughs> and enjoy the rest of the second half. Tactical discipline behind it.